bizarre and very interesting patient uh, patient I've seen. I mean, some of the stuff she tells you, and I think she's running a few minutes behind, but I'll give her opportunity to speak. Let me give you a little clinical history. So my patient is a 27-year-old female reported pain in the low back left hip for the last seven years. She played... She played for the varsity team, ice hockey. People who know what ice hockey is, I'll show a couple of videos to you before we jump on to her and how it is played and how what kind of injuries you can get. So she has low back pain, left hip pain, upper back pain, cervical pain, thoracic pain, jaw pain. When, when patients come to you and they tell you widespread pain, when they tell you widespread pain, I mean, that's just, gives you a gives you an idea that you should look towards something systemically i mean I, I think i i did like a thorough exam on her and some of the findings she told me was just way too bizarre so she had several concussions when she was playing ice hockey severe muscle twitching and spasms in the legs and arms with peripheral visual issues this patient has visual issues when she was 10 years old she had a facial reconstructive surgery after a dog bite. So she has some strabismus and that also contributes to some of the visual issues she has. When she has pain, it's 10 on 10. Nothing helps her. Okay. The day I saw her, she had a better day. She was saying one or two. But if you look at the symptoms and if you look at her symptom chart, it starts from here, everywhere, Jaw, she had difficulty opening the mouth. Upper back, severe upper back pain. Low back pain going into the bilateral legs. Okay. She tend to say that long duration activities, long duration standing, walking, sometimes long duration sitting, a lot of emotional stress affect her symptoms. If you just look at this kind of, this, this much history, you would like to put her into a, central sensitization or a psychosomatic disorder category that there's something wrong patient is depressed patient has central sensitization patient is hyper vigilant something like that but when you start doing a physical exam and start looking at things it all makes sense okay before i talk about jenna's video i'm going to show you because I told you that she played ice hockey and I'm gonna show you a video of how ice hockey is played. This is one of the National Hockey League hits video because I mean, this makes sense. So because the mechanism of injury is like probably eight, nine, 10 years ago, I'll just show you how this is played and how this sport is so brutal. Okay, so this is one of the hits. I'm not gonna show you, okay, I'll show this. So. And this is a very common sport where you can get hit, can have like concussions like this on daily basis. Okay. Can have concussions like this on daily basis. Yeah. And I'm going to play Jenna's video. I think she'll be here in a few minutes. And then I'll let her talk a little bit after that. Okay. So this is Jenna's videos. We, we, we shared this video on Instagram and Facebook, but this is a full version where she talks about her symptoms and, and stuff like that. I mean, and just ignore what she says about me and try to focus on what the symptoms she's giving you. Okay. So focus on what symptoms she's giving you so that this is like patient history and you have to listen carefully every word, what she's saying, because some of the stuff she tells you makes perfect sense of the diag underlying diagnosis, but sometimes we are not listening to our patients. So just listen to her very carefully and sometimes patients can also have difficulty explaining what they're experiencing hey everybody my name is jenna i have been working with tj for about a month and a half to two months now i've been suffering from chronic jaw neck shoulder upper back lower back and leg pain for a very very long time the first time i worked with tj was a game changer 100 percent. i've never been treated like that by any provider in my decade of trying to seek medical attention for 
my issues. I knew I knew that I was in good hands just from observing his assessment skills. His mentality is that he wants to fix the problem, not mask it, which to me is like what I've been searching for forever. I tend to find as someone in the meta uh in healthcare that many times we're just masking the problem, we're not really fixing anything. Um so definitely like working with him has made me so much more hopeful because number one, I'm, I'm, I'm feeling immediate results after every single session. Um, I started getting these like bone spurs prior to seeing TJ. This is actually what prompted me to go see him in the first place, but I would get these, like, it would feel like my neck is like breaking, like the bone is like cracking. And it left me feeling like my head is like a bowling ball on a pin. I couldn't turn my eye, my vision was getting affected, like the way I was breathing. So, you know, immediately after I'm like, I'm feeling relief and I'm feeling a little bit stronger. And, and TJ is so good about explaining everything that's going on to me. And he's good about telling me what he thinks is going on because now, because now we've like narrowed it down to like a timeline like this has been a decade of my life and every single time we're kind of narrowing it down to the pit like to exactly what you know the root causes which now we're thinking was my hockey playing that caused the instability in my neck which caught which has led to my jaw and it's crazy the amount of like other kind of symptoms that come with it but there's like no explanation for it until now I realized like everything is kind of connected. So yes. yeah, I, you know, I have nothing but good things to say about TJ. He's done wonders for me and I'm, I feel an improvement in my overall well being. My pain has subsided. My quality of life is better. Um, you know, what he's doing is, is definitely, definitely working. So it's made me very happy and I look forward to working with him again. Thank you. So I think Jenna will be here like soon. So I'll, she, this is some history, but when she starts talking about her symptoms, I think she'll tell you the stuff you have never heard from a patient. I mean, but this is a very, very fascinating patient. And I can promise you that cervical instability exists in the patient population you treat. It's not super common, but it's still present. Okay. Okay. I'm going to talk a little bit about cervical instability more, and then I'll ask Jenna. I think she'll be here in a couple of minutes. I'll ask her to have a. So back. Second. So this is what a patient with cervical instability can experience. So I was happy, I was running a checklist with Jenna that, can you tell me all these symptoms, how many of these symptoms do you experience, have you experienced over the period of 10 years? And she's almost checked off everything. Tremors, orthostatic dizziness or intolerance, vertigo, palpitation, shortness of breath, nausea, fatigue. She doesn't know what Lermity sign is, but I mean, it's pressure and then pressure in the back when you bend. It's like a kind of sign for meningitis. Cognitive and memory decline. Not sure about that. Clumsiness and motor delay, fainting, weakness of the limbs, occipital headaches, migraines, neck and shoulder and jaw pain, difficulty swallowing, Tenderness at the base of the neck, photophobia, which we usually associate with migraines, double vision, blurred vision, anxiety, and ringing in the ears. So the idea is, I was debating whether I should even treat this patient. If somebody comes and tells you, this is more than five Ds and three Ns, right? We talk about five Ds and three Ns. This is way more than five Ds and three Ns. But the point here is, this patient has no acute history, no acute history of injury. 
chronic history of playing ice ice hockey history of playing ice hockey chronic symptoms no acute trauma no car accident no no physical trauma okay i just want to know if any of you have seen a patient with cervical instability before have you seen a patient who presented with these kind of symptoms i'm just looking at the chat box no all of you can jump in and try to answer this no anyone similar to post concussion syndrome okay if you think from like neurophysiology standpoint what do you think is giving this the what do you think this why why does this patient is experiencing these symptoms can anybody tell me i mean what structure is getting compromised and why this patient is experiencing all these symptoms that's a good answer actually yep exactly there is a term called as medullary insufficiency where your medulla is getting compressed and that's what she tries to explain if you if you listen to the video carefully she talks about her head being like a feeling of bobble head where she feels like her spine is going to fall off or skull may fall off the spine okay and yeah definitely cranial nerve involvement but uh, involvement of sympathetic system involvement of cranial nerves 8 to 12 okay and involvement of kind of sympathetic system as well where patient is experiencing a lot of anxiety shortness of breath palpitation okay tremors so when patients tell you that i feel tremors in my hands tremors in my legs the explanation becomes very very difficult right how about vertebral artery i'm going to talk about the physical exam and how we diagnose and treat this condition we're going to talk about that i'm just waiting for jenna to join in and talk about her condition a little bit and then we'll talk about we'll talk about let me talk a little bit about the factors that can cause so usually the causes of cervical instabilities and underlying connective tissue disorder and we see this all the times we see patients with rheumatism having these disorders okay patients with connective tissue disorders patient with aller danlos syndrome aller, if you know about what aller danlos syndrome it's a connective tissue disorder where you have hypermobility okay poor posture trauma car injuries sports injuries cervical spondylosis and then you have some rare syndromes and these are related to down syndrome okay larsen syndrome most of these syndromes are related to down syndrome or they are congenital some genetic involvement okay and then one of the common ones which we see is arnold carey malformation where patients have extreme extreme hypermobility in the c1 c2 region you can have osteoradio necrosis after after chemotherapy radiotherapy you can have increased hypermobility in the upper neck Yeah, okay. congenital. You can have aplasia of odontoid process. Okay, but yeah, these are the findings. Usually, you see. I think I've seen one patient, but they they did not have all these findings, and the patient ended up having a cervical fusion. Okay, so the treatment usually is they usually do physiotherapy, and if it works really good. 
you don't have to go further there is some literature out there where they talk about using prolotherapy okay and then there is literature out there which talks about doing doing surgery like fusion okay I'm going to play this video one more time because then I'll, I'll, I just want you to pick up what she's saying one more time and then I'll let her talk. I think she's here. Yeah. Hey everybody, my name is Jenna. I have been working with TJ for about a month and a half to two months now. I've been suffering from chronic jaw, neck, shoulder, upper back, lower back, and leg pain for a very, very long time. Okay, Jen, I think I just want you to have a, I want you to sit for 15, 10, 15 minutes by explaining your symptoms. Oh, okay. 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 Yeah. Yeah. Um, so just to introduce yourself and just talk about your symptoms. Hi everyone. Um, my name is Jenna and um, so, my symptoms probably started 10 years ago now. Um, it kind of started with like intense lower back pain and leg pain. Um, and then it kind of has, you know, over the years gone up into my upper back, my neck and my shoulders. So lately in the past, like, um, I want to say like six months, I started getting these kind of like bone spurs that were happening. And the only way to describe it was like something was like pulling on each side and it would like just completely destabilize my neck. It was um, a weird feeling and it kind of locked from there. So like I would have like intense pain turning side to side and up and down. Um, I am a nurse and my job is very, um, it requires a lot of physical labor. And I think I started noticing it a lot more in that environment as well. Um, Working with TJ, we kind of established some other symptoms that I didn't even know were like related to the the issues I was having in my neck, like um, light sensitivity, tinnitus, um, just talk about the panic stuff. The what? The panic stuff. Oh, the panic. Yeah. Um, so I started getting panic attacks probably, I want to say, uh, when I started nursing school, actually, I, they started happening all the time, pretty much every day. And that was a weird thing that was going on that I just couldn't describe because basically what would start happening is like, I would get like numb, numbness and tingling in my like fingertips and basically like it progressed into what what felt like for me like electric shocks like it literally felt like I was um yeah like being shocked and what would happen is I would contract so hard that like I couldn't even move any anything um it's it's so painful like um that was like a really rough time for me um and i think the emotional stress really just in it severely influenced um you know all of these like symptoms from these like panic attacks um I went to nursing school in Boston and shortly after I graduated, I moved down here and I started nursing down here. Um, 
And one of the first things I noticed when I moved was um, how the panic attacks began to mitigate. Uh, obviously, like take myself out of like a really stressful environment back home um, had such an influence on that. But there's still there's still there, but like a lot of what I've tried to do is just like manage my emotional stress. It seems to be like there's some connection between like my how my body perceives stress and like how it just responds to it. It just kind of feels like it's like out of whack a little bit. Um so yeah, in the the light sensitivity was something that, that started like, I don't even know how long ago at this point, like it was just something that was always there. I kind of like attributed it to having like light colored eyes or something, but mine was pretty intense. <laughs> and um, I would get checked out by eye doctors and they're like, no, you have like perfect vision. It's not an, a vision issue. Um, so meanwhile, like keep in mind, like I'm seeing, I'm seeking medical attention for all of these like weird, unexplainable things that are just like happening to my body and nobody has really, um, helped me understand what's going on. I, I feel like I've had to do a lot of like research myself and try to just figure out ways that I can try to cope with the pain and um but yeah anyways long story short working with TJ like we kind of like established like you know we're thinking like this was hockey related um I played hockey my entire life probably started when I was like six or seven and I played all through high school. Um, I started off playing with the boys growing up, which is very common just when you're, um, you know, a kid. Um, obviously, as you know, I got older, the intensity picked up and I was still playing with the boys at that time. Um, no offense to the guys, but uh way too rough and I think I got kind of like tossed around a lot and I I feel like once I had stopped playing hockey completely after high school I started noticing like just like just weird dull achy pain all the time so I think quitting hockey abruptly like that caused a lot of issues but anyways like the TJ thinks, and I agree with him, that the kind of being tossed around destabilized my neck. But then kind of to compensate, I feel like my jaw had to, like, that's kind of like the best way I can at you least. Yeah, the jaw has been a huge issue. And it, I have like grinding issues, but I think now that like looking back on it, it was like, my neck was so weak so I had to compensate my jaw and I mean my teeth grinding is so bad that like my palate has narrowed like my gums have receded I've literally gotten a, a gum graft for this and everyone's like oh you're just like stressed and I'm like well yeah but like I'm I'm not um I'm not like actively like grinding it's just more of like how narrow um it just feels like my lower jaw has been like pushed up. So it's like, there's less space for, um, my, you know, your, how you, how you should normally like sit your tongue and stuff when you close your mouth. Um, so yeah, I mean like that. Talk about the visual stuff and Oh, um, when my neck started, um, having those like, spurs or whatever um basically like my yeah like turning side to side up and down like way too far 
it would start like obscuring like my peripheral vision it would just kind of like white out like if I just like kind of went too far that way um I'm feeling like a lot better like that I can like move like side to side and up and down and like my symptoms like kind of have gone down I've noticed um just because I feel like I have better range of motion but when it was at its like stiffest like I couldn't really like my line of vision was like narrowed I felt like um so that and on top of like getting like uh what are they called those like floaters mm -hmm. yeah I like I just thought that was like normal <laughs> like literally everything like that um that I've been like learning is that it's like all kind of like tied into um just how <laughs> my instability here and like um I feel like I'm like hype hype like I'm very stiff here mm -hmm. um but I'm trying to think what else um as far as like my vision oh like driving at night can't do like my um my depth perception I feel like has been uh like really really poor lately so um I don't know there's there's a lot of things going on here the tinnitus um I can't even I don't even know when it, these things all started like it was just like like over a decade, like things just got so much worse. Um, so now I'm kind of feeling like I'm trying to like reverse like years and years of just like, um, just like poor, like use of like my kind of like stabilizer muscles. Um, and I think it's like caused me to like slouch and just kind of uh, not, um, I don't know. I just feel it's off. Really <laughs> it's really hard to explain, but it's just like, yeah. But that's really like the brunt of everything that I've been feeling. Um, and since I've started working with TJ, like I've noticed a significant change in all of my symptoms um like so yeah I don't know he's he's doing a great job okay thank you thank you so yeah I mean this is probably the most bizarre pre patient presentation you guys see <laughs> oh the chewing yeah, yeah 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 so I think we mobilized the jaw and I think you slept for like 20 hours or something next day. Yeah, my <laughs> sleep has been like crazy since then. Okay, so we're going to talk about the physical presentation and I'm, I'm going to talk about what I saw on day one. So she had back pain and neck pain, cervical symptoms, lumbar symptoms, a mild left up slip, which we corrected on day one. The pelvis and lumbar spine was compensating for the upper cervical instability. I'm going to talk a little bit about the physical exam we did so to check ligament instability we usually check uh, do the ailer ligament testing and transverse ligament testing the testing in her case was negative but question for you you know how do you feel in a busy environment like busy grocery store uh overwhelmed i'm like definitely okay well it, it, yeah yeah, very overwhelmed. Yeah. I do think that there is a little bit of sympathetic upregulation. I think we spoke about that. I mean, panic attacks and stuff like that. And I also feel that when you were going through nursing school, you were sitting more than usual. Yeah, the sitting caused. Yeah, a and lot of yeah, and that caused more in instability and in sitting. They don't go out with each other. So so I'm going to demonstrate like ailer ligament testing and transus ligament testing. They're negative, but they feel very differently in her case. So I'll show you the test. I feel like when I test the ligaments, there is a delay in movement of C2 because we palpate the C2, C2, C2 spinous process. So I'll demonstrate that. And I'll, I mean, 
the funny thing is that there is no clear diagnostic test for cervical ligament instability. People do motion x-rays, which are not available in like clinical sciences much. I mean, research, yes, they do mobile x-rays all the time, but in clinical sciences, it's not available. Some chiropractors like to do like a flexion views and extension views in a neutral view. If the flexion views and extension view combine together, the displacement of the vertebra, C2 vertebra, is greater than three millimeters. It's called, it, they ca call it clinical instability. But in medical science, they don't diagnose that. In chiropractic, they, they do. So I'm going to demonstrate ailer test, ailer ligament test, and transverse ligament test. And I'll try to explain how it feels, okay? Depending on your back. Head here. Yeah, just lean. So what you do is you try to palpate C2 spinous process. And you see your neck link, right? I think we did this on day one. Yeah. And Yeah. So you feel the C2 spinous process and all you do is you do a little bit of a side bend. Yeah. The ideal response should be that spinous process of C2 should deflect away. In her situation, it deflects away, but there is a delay, which is very, if you have tested the neck, on few thousand patients, you can appreciate that difference. Yeah. We'll do it one more time. We'll talk about this in the cervical course when we travel to India, but I'm just gonna demonstrate that this is a very important test. So all you're doing is a little deflection, side bending. And ideally, the test is positive if the spinous process does not deflect away. In her case, it deflects away, but it's a very delayed response. Okay. For trans ligament, what we do is we keep the finger at the same C2 spinous process and we, we lift. And same, it should follow the head, but it follows the head with a delay. Okay. If you have done the, these tests on multiple people, you can definitely appreciate this, these subtle changes. Do you think this patient needs an x-ray? Look at the range of motion in the cervical spine. It was 60 degrees on either side. And if you look at Canadian C-spine rules, She did not have any recent history of trauma. She's able to rotate the neck 45 degrees. Okay. okay. So we did not have the radiograph, radiography done in her situation. Okay. I'm going to talk about a little bit about segmental mobility testing. So in her situation, the diagnosis is difficult. Treatment is very simple if you know what you're doing. Treatment is not hard. She's very hypermobile in the upper neck. Mobilization is are very easy. You don't have to be aggressive to mobilize her. So what I found was that she had, I think the first day I saw her, I told her that your right earlobe looks like this. <laughs> and she was, she, 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 she had a laugh about it because I could see like she was kind of stuck in like a massive right C01 Mia dysfunction, Mia not able to do lips. Okay. C12 closing dysfunction. A lot of upper back was trying to compensate. So she had a lot of extension hypermobility in C7, T1, T1, T2, T2, T3, T3. When I was ass assessing her, I assessed the jaw motion. I asked her to open the mouth. And remember, if you have like hypermobility at one segment, you're going to have a compensatory hypomobility at a segment above or below. So she, her neck, upper neck moves too much. We know that. 
where where will be the hypermobility the next joint next to it which is your jaw and that's why she feels a lot of grinding and you can see amount of tmj opening it's only 45 millimeters normal is usually 55 to 60 when she opens her mouth when she opens her mouth the jaw deviates to the right it's another very important finding i think in visit 6 or 7 we did some we did some intraoral jaw mobilizations yeah and we were able to address some she had some hip deficit we were able to address if you are treating patients with cervical hypermobility you definitely need to read an article by jule 2008 he talks he talks about and i'll share that article on the group he talks about how to assess deep neck flexor activation you can assess it with a blood pressure cuff or you can assess it assess it without a blood pressure cuff i'll just demonstrate this she's definitely doing a lot better but when we started this process i could just feel that she's not she wasn't firing any of the neck flexors okay so i'll just demonstrate that <laughs> So basically what you're queuing here is you yeah. you can use a tall roll. The better thing to do is use a blood pressure cuff and lift up the patient's head, stabilize it. And then you look for like, look for SCM, okay? Ask the patient to do a gentle nod, a little nod. And yeah, very gentle, okay? Ideally, what should happen is there should not be any motion of the SCM. But if you have like poor strength in your deep neck flexors, the SCM will kick on right away. And that's what happened in day one. I think she's able to do a little bit better because we have been working on it. Okay. You check deep neck flexor endurance by doing a chin tuck and asking patient to lift the head. I think she will have difficulty with it. And I can just see. I think for men, it's 43 seconds. For women, it's 38 seconds. That's a normal. Okay. So... Because she was not able to activate the deep neck flexors, we didn't go with the second part of the test because, I mean, there is no point. So if your patient is able to activate, I think Jules says if patient is able to give you like good 30 contractions, you can you can go and check the neck endurance. Okay. Other muscles that were weak were lower trapezius, rhomboids, So this is the diagnosis. You can do x-rays, but it won't show anything. MRI and CT is useful if there's an acute injury because it might show you a, some, some ligament damage or ligament st stretching. But if it's a chronic thing, I mean, I'm, I'm sure CTs and MRIs are redundant. You can try stress x-rays, do a neutral view, do extension view, do a flexion view. If you combine the findings of flexion x-rays and extension x-rays and the motion is greater by three, greater than three millimeter. The chiropractic literature says that's a sign of instability. Yeah, that's one thing we can do. Yeah, the question was, should we treat it? I was debating that whether should we treat it. I think she mentioned that she would want to see a neurologist. I just wanted to give it a try. So she definitely had a dysfunction and we know that there's underlying hypermobility. Do we, should we do aggressive manipulation? Probably not. We did some gentle distractions. I think if you look at like literature by Saunders and it, he talks about instability and he talks about how cervical distraction can improve symptoms of symptoms of patients with instability. So we did gentle cervical distractions. Okay. I'll just demonstrate these couple of techniques and we did C23 mobilizations. 
Okay. We did some thoracic manipulations because she was very stiff in the upper back. So the point is that she has some hypermobile segment and which is your upper cervical and then she has hypermobility in the jaw and upper thoracic. So what we're trying to do is we're trying to gain mobility in like hypo hypermobile segments and we're trying to stabilize that moves too much. Very simple principle. And that's why I think the treatment is not very hard. If you understand the biomechanics, the diagnosis is. Okay. And then we did some upper thoracic manipulations prone. I'll demonstrate these techniques. Okay. And then we, want, we wanted to strengthen whatever it was weak, so rhomboids and lower trap activation. We did some pivot prones to activate lower trapezius, improve deep neck flexor activation. We worked on W's lower trapezius activation and then our usual pelvic stabilization because we found weakness in posterior gluteus medius, gluteus maximus, and hip, hip external rotators. Okay. And this is, I think, the track we are trying to follow. We just started doing some laser beam stuff to kick on the deep neck flexors in functional position. And she absolutely struggles with it because she, <laughs> she absolutely struggles with it. So, and our plan is to progress it in various position, maybe sit on the ball, sit on unstable surface so that we can work on that deep neck flexor endurance, okay? And the crazy thing is even doing a little bit just changed our symptoms dramatically, yeah? We just started doing this like two visits, two visits ago, three visits ago, and she's already, I think I've seen her like seven or eight times, eight times. So I'm gonna demonstrate some upper cervical and upper thoracic manipulations and mobilizations, and then, if you have, then we'll take questions. Just lay on your back. So when you're suspecting hypermobility, your force production or force should be very, very minimum when you're trying to mobilize the upper cervical spine because you don't want to manipulate aggressively that is moving too much because you don't need that amount of force. So I'm going to demonstrate this upper cervical distraction. Either you can do a suboccipital release. Either you can just do a suboccipital release, or what you can do is you can do a little chin strap technique. Get your hand on the, without choking your patient, make sure you use just the two fingers, and you can lift up the three fingers, and then just do a little glide. That's good enough. Or if you're not comfortable doing this, all you have to do is just get your hands, and this is a very elementary technique, get your high, hands behind the occiput and you're just pulling it. Yeah. Don't have to be aggressive. Patient is already hypermobile. If you mobilize in correct direction, you'll probably get the desired result. Yeah. Yeah. I'm going to show you C23 distraction. As we know that C23 is a transitional zone, and transitional zones are more prone to dysfunction. So, and patient also had some restriction in rotation, not great, but I mean, some restriction rotation. C1, to C1, C2 closing dysfunction. So we can definitely mobilize C2, 3, and also manipulate C1, 2 very carefully if you want to. So what you do is, If you're trying to mobilize the right side, lift the patient's head, okay? You do a ipsilateral side bending, contralateral rotation, okay? Use two fingers on patient's chin. You're trying to find the articular pillar of C2, which is not hard to find because C2 spinous process is the biggest spinous process, okay? They call it hug touch squeeze, but you can lift it up, get close to the patient. And then your direction of force is towards the opposite eye. That is how you mobilize it, gentle. You don't have to produce a lot of force. If you think the patient's head is moving too much, you can just, and then just gently, yeah. 
she does not have a lot of restriction right now, but I think when we started doing it, I think she was very restricted in upper cervical, though she's hypermobile. Thoracic manipulation, one of the most common manipulations we use for lumbar, lumbar pain, cervical pain, thoracic pain, for all the very, very simple technique. I'll just demonstrate this too. And treating the opposite gender, it's not a bad idea to use a pillow, a sufficient to hug a pillow, so that there is a barrier between you and them. Hug the pillow. The patient is hugging the pillow and either you can use you can use a mid palmar crease you're locking the spinous process in the mid palmar crease okay some people like to do this that's fine too i like to manipulate with the open hand okay okay so you come here okay try to lock the spinous process in your mid palmar crease with fingers flexed or fingers extended, okay? Turn the patient and then you flex to the segment and then just do a little quick. Quick okay. thrust. Yeah. If she's already hypermobile, hypermobile where? She's hypermobile in the cervical spine. So, if you attended the foundations lecture, we talked, we spoke about how hypermobile people are more prone to getting locked. Okay. So if patients who have underlying hypermobility, they tend to get like locked in their spine. They feel like because they have more degrees of freedom, more range of motion, we definitely want to mobilize the hypermobile segment, but very carefully. Okay. Because hypermobile patients also, also have dysfunctions it doesn't matter i mean they have more range of motion but it doesn't mean that they don't have dysfunction so we want to manipulate but we want to manipulate with caution okay we don't need to produce a lot of force when we're trying to manip manipulate or mobilize a hypermobile segment but what hypermobility does it it gives you hypermobility at a segment above or segment below so in her situation upper cervical spine is hypermobile it and she feels hypermobility in the jaw and upper thoracic spine so we definitely want to take care of that hyper hypermobility. Okay. I hope that answers. Okay. Yep. Another technique you can use for upper thoracic manipulation is either you can do a supine technique or ask the patient to bridge, or you can ask you can do this. Do you mind going on your stomach? So there are various, this te technique is called pivot chin thrust or chin pivot thrust. Patient is in prone, chin on the edge. You can do a little side bending. I do it very differently. Some people like to do it with complete rotation, which I'm not a huge fan of because we know rotation kinks the vertebral artery. You can try McKenzie mobilization for thoracic spine. It's fine. I mean, I mean, the idea is to idea is to address what is hypermobile. You can use any technique you wish. Okay, I like to do this way. I just distract the head a little bit, a little side bending, and then I put my pisiform on the transverse process, and then I try to manipulate anterior laterally. Yeah, let's go like this. Not very stiff. Yeah. Okay. We'll talk a little bit about excise prescription. Her lower trapezius strength and rhomboid strength was three on five. We did work on that. She was struggling to do pivot prone. I think first day, I think we tried doing this. She could barely, barely do it. But I think over the period of time with thoracic manipulations and and more cueing, and I mean, I think she was able to able to do pivot prone. 
Okay, a great exercise to activate lower trapezius, rhomboids. And if you maintain a good chin position, you can you can activate deep neck flexors. Okay. And then another exercise for lower trapezius activation. I think all of us have used that technique. Regular exercise, regular regular exercises for pelvic stabilization. You can try bridges for glute max. Supine so clamshells for hip external rotators, which were weak. You can use clamshells for targeting posterior gluteus medius. And then we did some dry needling on upper upper back, because upper trapezius and levator scap were very hypertonic. But yeah. Any questions you have, guys? This is a fascinating topic because you don't see this very often. I've seen one or two. But this is like the full blown. This is my first full blown cervical instability where he, she presents with almost everything. Okay. These are, these are the references. If you have any questions, I'm going to stick around for five, 10 more minutes. We can have a discussion. So just sharing the dates with you again, we are in Bombay from 1st to 7th September, uh, 1st to 7th October, and then we fly to Delhi from 9th to 9th to 15th. If you have any questions, please reach out to Dr. Dhrumi. She's taking care of the registrations and signups. Any questions you have, guys? Okay, can you please explain the benefits of supine versus prone? I think it's a preference. I mean, what about her visual symptoms? How are visual symptoms? Have they changed? Um, yeah, like sometimes like the achiness has mm. kind of gone down. The the light sensitivity has not. Um, but like like I can turn this way more and mm. not get like any sort of floaters or like kind of hazy. This way I feel a little bit more. So she's saying that she has better peripheral vision, but she still feels like some yeah. some achiness. Yeah, it's like a weird thing that kind of like goes like all the way. And photosensitivity symptoms are still there. She's not there where she should be, but she's definitely doing better. As far as supine and thoracic maneuver, I think you can pick and choose what you want to do. As long as you're comfortable doing that technique and you get the desired result, I think you can use it. Pelvic bridges exercise causes hamstring cramp. I, I usually do pelvic bridges with a lot of knee flexion just to make hamstrings actively insufficient. And that just solves the problem. It's a very simple fix. Yeah, or you can use a ball underneath. I mean, just like you use a Swiss ball, patient's knees are flexed and hips are, hips are flexed a little bit more. The one thing I have noticed a lot too is like my chilling and like um, just like sleeping. Mm -hmm. The sleeping, I was still sleeping like so much. And what was the dosage of manipulation and mobilization that that was given? I mean, you do manipulation mobilization until you gain the desired mobility. Yeah, which is a fairly young patient. She's twenty seven, fairly young patient. When to opt for surgical manager PT fails. The thing is, yes, I mean, PT fails, but PT hasn't failed, right? I can go back to the symptom slide, yes. These are the symptoms. And if you look at the symptoms, I mean, and the funny thing is when I was making this presentation, I texted Jenna, I said, can you tell me what all symptoms have you experienced? I think we, she's experienced most of them at some point of time, not not everything at the same day on the same day, but at some point of time. So, yeah. But yeah, cervical fusion is the answer. But I mean, patient is doing fantastic. I mean, she's improving. She's chewing better. Her pain is better. Her symptoms in the hand or the hands are better. So I mean, we're heading in the right direction, and we just do definitely need to keep doing what we're doing. But the idea was to share this patient presentation because this is not what you see in the clinic every day. And another thing I want to add is that manual therapy is not about popping and cracking. Manual therapy is about clinical reasoning. Where I think most people struggle is they just want to 
pop the joint and they think, oh, that's the problem. So it's about your understanding of when to pop. She doesn't need a lot of manipulation. She's hypermobile. I mean, yes, there she has some hypermobile segments, and but we manipulated very carefully. We did a little bit of upper cervical stuff, and I think that was good enough to fix the Mia, Mia dysfunction, good enough to fix the closing dysfunction, one, two, two, three. Okay. Yes, we can consider that, but I mean, definitely counseling can be considered, other, other factors are considered, but I think we are seeing a change in symptoms right away. And I mean, it should make like clinical sense. The idea is that when you're talking about cervical instability, you're also talking about a lot of sympathetic nervous system involvement. And it's a biomechanical cause of sympathetic nervous system involvement. Okay, if you if you, if you if you're trying to fix the biomechanical cause, and that's what we do as physical therapists, right? Fix the biomechanical cause. And if biomechanical cause causes are changing her symptoms, why go for anything else at this point? If we, I, I do think that she has a very very good prognosis with just conservative rehab. Yeah. I did some intraoral mobilizations. I haven't given her TMG exercises and at some point I want to, but I think the, I think a couple of visits ago, I first mobilized the TMJ. I'll show, I can show you, demonstrate the intraoral technique, just a simple distraction technique. And I think she's, she went home and slept for like 20 hours and she's been sleeping way more than usual uh, since then. So the idea is that we're trying to stabilize what is hypermobile and mobilize what is hypermobile and trying to fix the TMJ. Okay, I'll quickly demonstrate TMJ intraoral manipulation or mobilization. And I think we are doing an elective on TMJ. So we're going to talk about TMJ and what the research says. Fascinating research is coming out from TMJ. I think last year or two, they published like, if you look at orthopedic section of APTA, they have published like tons of stuff on APT, uh, tons of stuff on TMJ. So we're going to be talking a lot about TMJ research and what, what does the new new treatments, what, what are the new treatments for TMJ? So let me demonstrate this intraoral mobilization. And I think we'll talk about this more in the TMJ course. If the ligament tests were positive, I would have gone for the, for the MRI. I would have gone for the MRI, I would have gone for the consult, but the ligament tests are negative. The, but the, the crazy thing is when you, I've tested thousands of patients. I mean, I've, every time I see any symptoms that in cervical spine that are not apart from pain, if five Ds, three Ns, she, her neck feels very different than most of the patients because you have that motor feel. I think there is a definite delay when you do a little side bend. The, 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 the spinous process moves away, but it's very slow. And it's kind of, there's a delay there. And that's, that shows the signs of segmental hypermobility so I think the thing is when you practice these practice this test, these techniques, I mean, you you're able to differentiate between people how they feel. Okay. Yeah. I mean, if she was she was test, uh, she had numbness and tingling type of pain. Yes, she did. She had bilateral numbness and tingling. And that could be secondary to cervical thoracic dysfunction, right? Your cervical thoracic dysfunction can compress the lower part, lower cord of brachial plexus giving you symptoms in the bilateral hand. The funny thing is we were talking and I have manipulated the C71, her hand symptoms went away. Okay, so yes, you, and that's why it's important to understand the clinical reasoning because you have hypermobile segments and then you have hypomobile segments. You manipulate the hypomobile segments and make sure that you stabilize where there is hypermobility. If she was, she was tested positive, she tested positive for the, for the ligaments, I mean, I would have given a given her a hard collar or a soft collar. Probably, I would have sent her to an orthopedic guy. Yeah, because we want the ligaments to heal, right? But she does not have any acute trauma, so that's why I mean, if there was a ligament injury back in the day, and things would have healed in all these years. Okay. Yeah. Any more questions, guys? Why do we get cervical vertigo and dizziness and cervical instability? I think people in this group can answer this question. Anybody who can answer this question? I can answer this. This is very easy. Anybody who can answer this question? Why people get dizziness and, and vertigo and cervical instability? Is it relatable? Yes, absolutely. Anybody wants to take this question? Dr. Hassan, do you want to answer this question? I think you can.
your nucleus of your eighth vestibule of cochlear nerve sits in, in, in the brainstem medulla. Okay. And whenever you have instability, there's increased firing of the eighth nerve, which is your vestibule of cochlear nerve. And that is responsible for your vertigo, you know? So, Increased firing of that vestibular cochlear nuclei gives you signs of dizziness and vertigo. Yeah. Remember, I mean, we were talking about medullary compromise. Your eighth to twelfth nerve are in your medulla. Yeah. And that's why you're seeing all these bizarre symptoms. That's why understanding the neurophysiology is important, especially when you're treating with upper cervical stuff. Yeah. We're going to talk about cranial nerve testing in the cervical module in greater detail because cervical seems a very easy, easy lecture, but it's not. I mean, it, you can find we can find patients like Jenna. I mean. Any more questions, guys? Well, thank you guys for your time. I hope you learned something. And if you see, I mean, that's the, can you? Yeah, giddiness and dizziness are very similar. Same reason for tinnitus, yes, absolutely. Your eighth vestibular cochlear nerve, there are two components, your cochlear component that gives you tinnitus, and then you have vestibular component that gives you dizziness and giddiness, vertigo kind of symptoms, okay? Cranial nerve testing could be very important for this type of patient. Compromising respiratory centers. So I think it's a very good question. I think there is a research article which talks about relationship between vagus nerve and upper cervical instability. So upper cervical instability tend to influence the, influence the vagus nerve. And that's why you have symptoms like symptoms like palpitations, and that is because of the vagus nerve. Okay. And that can affect the respiratory rate also. That's what I'm saying. Yeah, Breathing. That, yeah. Like, yeah. I mean, I can share that research article. That's a very interesting research. And it's, yeah. So it affects your breathing too. So basically, and that's why she's experiencing all this cluster of symptoms. And, but the, the, the point is that she's not experiencing everything the same day. And that's why it's difficult for medical providers to put everything together. Okay. But when you look at the list of symptoms, she checks off most of them. Yeah. We'll share this lecture on YouTube. And I mean, you can have a... I would say that she has like secondary diagnosis. She has TMJ disorder, upper thoracic disorder, left hip pain. Yeah, you can say that, but... But you have to find the primary diagnosis. And that's why we talk about fixing the problem. You can have all these presentations, but you have to find the cause, what is leading to these secondary manifestations, arm pain, leg pain, all these symptoms we are talking about. And it is, the primary diagnosis is cervical instability, and that has led to jaw issues, upper back issues, ribcage issues, breathing issues, left hip issues. Okay. And when you fix the primary cause, you're going to fix this patient. Otherwise, you can just keep keep treating stuff. Okay. Any more questions, guys? I think talk to Dr. Dhrumi about it. She'll she'll she handles the administrative side of things. Thank you all. I think my patient, uh, yeah, we'll, I think we're doing another lecture. And I can demonstrate intraoral mobilization. I think that's the last thing.
So you sanitize your hands and then you put gloves on. Okay. You can do this technique in supine. I like to do it in sitting because I can get behind the patient. So I'll just demonstrate this. Okay. So you see this thumb, okay? I put my thumb in between patient's molars, okay? And I come wrap around. I do a little bit of side bend and same side bending contralateral rotation. And then ask the patient to bite my finger gently, okay? And what I'm trying to do is, I just can take my hand out, okay? I'm trying to glide like down and out. So you're trying to glide in like downward and interior position. So you're trying to do this. Okay, and I'll demonstrate this. Okay. And I can block the occiput, do a little bit of a side bend, try to try to lock in, you can bite a little hard, that's fine. And try to like glide it down and out. Yeah. So this is our intraoral mobilization. 